Agora vamos dar início ao debate. É, primeiramente, nós vamos convidar os debatedores, que terão no máximo 10 minutos cada um para fazer as provocações, né, para contribuir com o debate, e depois abriremos para, o, para as perguntas gerais do público. Neste momento, convidamos os debatedores a comporem a mesa para discutir as perspectivas sobre o tema da palestra. A partir da ciência da computação, das ciências sociais e da filosofia. Professor Dr. Marcos Barreto. Professor Dr. Gustavo Mata. Barreto é professor associado no Departamento de Ciência da Computação da Universidade Federal da Bahia, pesquisador do Laboratório de Sistemas Distribuídos nas áreas de Ciência de Dados, Computação Intensiva de Dados e Robótica em Nuvem, membro de grupos de trabalho da IEA, Ontologias para Robótica e Automação, Robótica Auto Autônoma, Robótica Industrial e Data Privacy Process, e é pesquisador colaborador do CIDAD. Okay, bom dia. Uh, I think we should discuss in English. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Betania, Maurice, Yuri, and all these nice people for this uh, huge and amazing opportunity of uh, discussing uh, AI, ethics, and linkage in several topics around public health. Uh, second, uh, thanks, Sabina, for this amazing talk wrote down some <laughs> several ideas to discuss with you um, and I, I okay I have only 10 minutes so I have some specific points to uh, bring to discussion uh, first one is about uh, how we can uh, merge uh, big data and the fair principles uh, especially for the uh, uh, re uh, reusable uh, aspect of big data. But I think big data is not so reusable as we imagine because you see some people working with uh, large volumes of data and if you want to reply this and replicate this you need to have the same uh, uh, technical and, 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 and personal skills to uh, deal with this large amount of data. So I think uh, uh, big data is still used as a kind of a, a very specific topic or, or in silos and then we are, um, most of the time we are unable to replicate most of these studies. So this is the first one. Uh, you mentioned about uh, data semantics and, and, and mobile data as evidence, and I, I think this is a, a, a great idea, but my question is how to uh, ensure we have the same uh, um, terminology, the same representation, uh, we, if when we consider uh, health, uh, the, the health domain, we have lots of uh, terminologies, ontologies, archetypes, etc. But when uh, when you, you see to uh, social or other domains, I think we don't have the same approach, the same standards. So how we can truly ensure that data will be able to move from one domain to the other domain and be used as evidence with a, 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 a a specific uh, uh, or, or acceptable level of uh, accuracy or trust, trustworthiness. Um, I like your idea about um, being able to um, link and uh, or aggregate data and disaggregate data. But I, 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 I'm, I'm, I see this is a, 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 a huge problem because you have to deal with two levels of bias because uh, data leakage is about bias, you, uh, we are very concerned about uh, aggregation bias or uh, uh, selecting the, the, the right uh, uh, subpopulation or be sure that we are aggregating the right piece of data from different sources. And when you talk about disaggregation, uh, we need to uh, specify which level of disaggregation bias or uncertainty are acceptable because 
uh, uh, most of the time the, the linkage, linkage process is not deterministic or we don't have 100% of accuracy, etc. So how we can move this, uh, this kind of uncertainty and bias from the, the linking phase to the disaggregation phase. Um, <clears throat> The fourth point is uh, about, uh, you mentioned about AI fairness, which I think is a, is a very uh, concern worldwide. And again, um, linkage is about uh, de uh, dealing with bias, and AI, in some sense, needs some bias in order to provide fairness. So if you have an um, 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 unbalanced uh, data set, you need to input some data, in order to make fairness uh, predictions, and in some sense you are introducing some bias to avoid uh, gender bias or race bias or any other type of bias. So, uh, uh, for me, there is a, 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 a huge concern about how to provide uh, AI fairness, and uh, depending on a, a huge amount of data that we, uh, were linked from different sources, and how we combine this. Uh, and the last one is uh, about your last slide, which I think it's a, it's a good, a good uh, uh, a summarization of the, the discussion today, uh, which is about data, um, the, all, all, all the views from big data, and especially for the, the value uh, meaning. Uh, I think we are all, uh, we, uh, everyone agrees about uh, uh, volume, velocity, variety, I think this is a consensus worldwide, but when you mention about value, I think this is a kind of a biased uh, 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 view, because uh, you mentioned about marketization versus public service, I think this is the point, because when, when, when you talk about the, the value of data, uh, 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 I think we are more uh, convinced or more prone to, 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 to look at data as a, a private asset instead of putting on the, on the public uh, service. So how we can uh, convince people or, 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 or make a movement to try to redefine value as a, a, a utility or, or using the usability approach and in, in, in provide some guidance of this. And I have uh, many other points to discuss here, but I think <laughs> this is just so for time constraints. These are some good points to, to, to discuss here. Okay? Thank you. Would you like to, to answer now or collect all the questions? Agora, então, a palavra é o doutor Gustavo Mata. Gustavo Mata possui graduação em psicologia pela Universidade de Santa Úrsula, mestrado e doutorado em saúde coletiva pelo Instituto de Medicina Social da UERJ. Atualmente, é pesquisador em saúde pública da Escola Nacional de Saúde Pública Sérgio Arouca, da São Oswaldo Cruz, é, coordena a rede Zika de Ciências Sociais da Fiocruz e é editor associado da revista Físicas de Saúde Coletiva. Tem experiência na área de saúde coletiva, com ênfase em políticas e planejamento de saúde, atuando principalmente nos seguintes temas. Emergências e reemergências de saúde, atenção primária em saúde, políticas e gestão do cuidado em saúde e saúde global. Thank you very much. Um, so, I would like to thank a Betania Mauricio and congratulations on this three years celebration of CEDAX. So, it's a pleasure to be here as a field cruise researcher, as a public health researcher, and as well as a citizen that uh, there is concern about the use of the data and how to defend science in a good way to defend our national health system <coughs> and how to face inequality in this unequal country, as you said. So, uh, I think that this uh, meeting is very important to develop so how to create uh, tools ethically and socially uh, feasible uh, to apply to face inequalities in our uh, country in our world so uh, Sabina 
to bring this <laughs> in the mouth of question. I am organizing the ideas and, uh, and thank you very much for your presentation. I think that we could spend the whole week <laughs> discussion many of your topics. Uh, I'm, I'm still organizing my ideas, but I would like to highlight uh, some topics with you. Many of them I completely agree, but uh, I would like to discuss with you some uh, suggestions or what uh, topics or suggestions you think about your face is challenging. So, data or information came from different languages different epistemic backgrounds and epistemic communities, different uh, data contests and data origins, and for me, it's a giant, uh, I think that is not the specific question of SEDAX, but our the big data movement, they would like to standardize the data and erase this origin. So you recreate uh, the data and the information. So, um, for me, in a constitutionalism perspective, so it's not just to produce the data, but you create the data, and how we can discuss the use the data. So, I think just uh, just uh, some principles of this conversation. So. Uh, I am, uh, from my experience on Zika research, so when you receive uh, funding from international funding, you have to share your data. So especially after the welcome uh, declaration about data sharing. So it was a specific challenge in Brazil. So we didn't have and did, still don't have a, a culture of data sharing. Uh, uh, and specifically uh, among us nationally. So, until now, just to have an idea, we don't have uh, harmonized data nationally on clinical data about uh, Zika research, but we share the data to international uh, institutions. Specifically with the NIA, CDC, and other important countries. So, for me, in that time, so there's a kind of a competition. WHO, European Commission, NIA, CDC, who will get the data and who will store the data? So, what do you think about that? This global competition about which platform will store health data? So, uh, now, WHO is developing a new, is trying to develop a new platform to store clinical data on Zika and try to analyze different interests on it. So, uh, this is a important political uh, and sociological problem for me. So, um, using uh, the uh, actor uh, theory network. So how do you think uh, the dialogue or the interaction between researchers and data itself? So when you create a data setting, so the data setting uh, is dialogue with the research. That's not anymore an object-subject relationship. I think that uh, this amount of data has a language itself and that it is dialoguing with the research and different research interests. So how uh, the data setting uh, choose the object of research or the researcher? Yes, you got it? Yeah, this, this question. So, and the last question for me, it is also important, with many other questions that I would like to discuss with you, but I think that it's impossible to develop all the reflections that I would like to, to discuss. So, the question of the anonymized data in health, it's very old. So, in health services, we use, 
health information since the beginning of the resisted offset without the uh, consent of the patients. So, after the, 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 the ERC protocols, we start to use it. But, especially in the hospitals, we use the, 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 the health data uh, without anonymization. So, in this question of the digital or data literacy, what's your suggestion to dialogue with society? How to engage society, not in a, a way to convince that share your data is good, just it. So I think that is a kind of uh, hypothesis or rhetoric discuss when you're talking about data sharing or sharing your data to scientific research. It's uh, good itself. This is an important ethical discussion and how to discuss this in an equal world. So how to discuss with the people who were uh, affected by Zika epidemic. So just let you know, we identify informed consent in the Northwest of the, the Brazil in English and in Norwegian with poor families in the countryside of uh, the country. So Brazil became a big laboratory. Uh, researcher from all over the world and here uh, to investigate a new disease that uh, it was sick. And there's no respect on it. So how we could decolonize this process and in an interaction that's not engaged society but discuss in the interactive society since the beginning. We discussed a little bit about it uh, uh, yesterday afternoon. Right? And um, I would like to to share this question with you. How to in, uh, use social science in humanities? So, because for me, uh, when I am invited from the global health uh, interests, and especially medical interests on social science, so they would like to translate scientific information to society, to use social science uh, to convince people and uh, to translate scientific knowledge to them. So, what your, I know, <laughs> but I would like to, to, to listen more about this, how you think how social scientists and humanities can interact with this data science and data production uh, field. That's it, but we can continue discussion. Okay, thank you. First of all, Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gustavo. I will pass now to the Dr. Giovanni Rola. Giovanni Rola is a professor of the of group of interinstitutional and active cognitive and narrative practices. He is a doctor in philosophy at the University of the Rio Grande do Sul e atuou principalmente com os seguintes temas, teoria do conhecimento, digitivo, digitivismo, <risos> epistemológico, cognição corporificada e nativismo, justificação epistêmica, setismo e normatividade. Ok, thank you. I was so eager to make a question. So, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm so glad to be here. It's just an amazing opportunity to watch something very informative, so um, so clear. So, and also I'd like to thank Professor Sabine for the, the amazing talk. As I was listening to your talk, I was thinking about the implications of data science for philosophy of science as a philosopher. I don't work specifically with philosophy of science, but mine, uh, I think, there are, there may be implications on how to conceive of science in that science, and I think this is something you touched upon very briefly. I'd like to hear more about that. If we have a new conception of science, or if we can make this idea of that science in, to make it fit into some existing theories of what it is to, to do science. Because it seems to me quite clear that, it is quite clear that there is no 
blurred, uh, there is no, the lines are blurred between theoretical and uh, practical applications of data because you collection of data and reuse of data. If I understood you well, they are the same. There is no clear division between theoretical science and uh, practical science here, but I think this is a division that philosophers sometimes use. It's artificial anyways. So I'd like to hear more about that. If you have a, what are the implications for philosophy of science when you are doing data science? It seems to me, I have just vague uh, uh, intuitions about, well, if you conceive of data as evidences, so maybe you can make it fit into some existing conception of science according to some philosophers. But I think you have very important steps and tools and maybe something entirely new, so I'd like to hear about that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. I want to thank again the organizers of, of the event for the amazing panel that they allowed me to converse with. And thank you very much to all three of you for the amazing questions which you came up with just at the drop of a hat, which is incredibly impressive. So thank you for this. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot to pick up on here. I guess I will uh, start from Giovanni's question briefly, just because it's very easy, because I'm a philosopher, so actually really that's what I think about pretty much 90% of the time. So that's not that there's an easy answer, but that's something that I, I'm obviously um, very used to uh, think about. So um, I think what I try to do in my work is to, is to really examine this question about what does it mean to take data seriously for philosophy of science, which seems like a kind of obvious thing that philosophers have been doing for a long time, but in fact there's very little work or well, at least there has been for a long time on the role of data in scientific research. And that's partly because there's a big tradition in philosophy of science, which goes back at the very least at the beginning of the last century, certainly kind of Western and American philosophy of science, of thinking about science as something that starts from statistics. Anything that happens before you start to think about formal models of data is just messy. It's messy experimental or observational practice, which there's really nothing philosophical to think about there, so let's move on and start from models. You know? And that's pretty much where we got in philosophy, at least until 10 years ago. The idea was, well, you know, yeah, we have acknowledged the fact that science is not all about theories, but now we're focusing on models, and models are all there is, and I mean, and this, you know, the semantic approach to theory is actually saying, basically, models are theories, and that's how we resolve like, the problems of thinking about the scientific method. So, I mean, I think the kind of work I and others have been doing is to emphasize the fact that when you take seriously the work that concerns data, processing, cleaning, modeling, actually, visualization, uh, theorization, which in my, in my philosophical perspective actually comes in the moment you try to classify the book, which is why semantic theory is very important, because it challenges the whole theory in science in a much, much broader sense than just, you know, here's the little name that we use to classify the data. Um, and of course, experimentation, what does it mean to different data types? I mean, once you start to really think through these issues, a lot of the standard ways of thinking about methodology in philosophy science start to look problematic. So a lot of the work you know, that's happened in, on the notion of evidence, in, specifically in medicine, very relevant here, and has basically happened in thinking about formal inferential systems. Now, in some realms, that's of course very, very useful. But, you know, there's a reason why a lot of our practitioners working with their medical data always find that problematic from philosophers. I mean, what do we do with this? I mean, we, don't, we don't work with formal structures of that kind. Inferentialism will not save us, you know, that kind of thing. So I think there's, there's a big message there in terms of really reconceptualizing science. I mean, at the moment, you know, I've written quite a lot about all of these different issues and, you know, the IRQ models, for instance, that basically falls down the moment you start to take data seriously because this doesn't work anymore. And what I'm working on now is what, in fact, it means to think about empiricism. So that's what my book that right now really is about. But of course, it's a huge political question at the moment where, you know, as Gustav was saying, like, it's, it's, it's science is on trial. And there are big issues around trust of science. Why should we fund this kind of research? What makes scientific research more trustworthy than other sources of knowledge? And I mean, my position on this, and I think that really comes from the work on data, is that making sure that we move away from a conception of data as some sort of God-given sign of nature is the first step into making empiricism a much more likable proposition also politically. 
because now a lot of the political attacks on science come from a widely misunderstood uh, distinction between science and values. Right? I mean, if you accept what I regard as a really problematic idea, <laughs> that science is nothing to do with values, nothing to do with policy, nothing to do with any of that, uh, then it's very easy to attack science. Because of course you're going to find, like any example of scientific research, which has intersections and contaminations, whatever you want to call them, with value issues and decisions which are not necessarily purely epistemic, but come from other parts of, of, of uh, you know, your social experience. Now, I think when one thinks philosophically about data we are trying to do, one acknowledges immediately that data are not given, there are artifacts, which are produced through sometimes very sophisticated uh, production ways, other times they're produced with very terrible methodologies. And you can absolutely discriminate between the two, but they're artifacts nonetheless. And so that, that already shifts your mentality about what does it mean to think about data as a starting point. So they're not really a starting point. They're one component of an iterative cycle that keeps iterating, basically, number one. Number two, the idea that you're going to a database and you find lots of facts, a huge issue, because again, it takes away the recognition that, you know, as I was trying to talk about here, the work that goes into data curation and data management is profoundly theoretical and affects interpretation in a, to a very large degree sometimes. And so, you know, I think we just need to move away from the idea that all these different parts of science that have, have been typically thought of as technical parts, you know, technicians would do that, people that are paid less than PIs, people who are, in fact, are not part of discovery. They are, in a big way, part of discovery. Sometimes they are the foundation of what people then end up doing, what we sign the big article, you know. And so, all of that leads indeed to reconceptualization of science, but I think more importantly, it allows you to put back discussion about values and value judgment and theorization and semantics straight into the world you're doing data. So now you have, hopefully, a socially responsible empiricism, which is not just about let's read the gibbons that nature gave us, but acknowledging the fact that when we're doing science, we are interacting with nature in very particular ways, which can be better or worse. We have incredible knowledge that comes from centuries of more and more sophisticated methods of interacting with nature. And, you know, the um, validity and reliability of our inferences is grounded on the fact that there's value judgments involved in this, not on the fact that these are neutral processes. I mean, it's a very big philosophical project, but I think that's the gist of it. I mean, and I'm starting with that also because, of course, it comes to some of the other issues um, uh, that you were raising. And, you know, and I mean, in fact, it's quite funny, but I mean, one of the things I ended up doing in the last three years was to work, well, five years, in fact, is to work a lot with the European Commission on research assessment and reward. And, and partly that, that for me was because, and it's interesting that they recognized it, which I think is, is very, very useful of, of them, that actually the direct implication of this kind of philosophical work and the scientific work is that we think scientific credit. Because if you don't do that, then all of this other issues sort of fall apart. So it's, it, it's, it's a very interesting situation. Now, um, lots of um, big questions raised here. Now, um, they're all, but I, I guess I'll go backwards because it follows quite nicely. So, the role of social science and humanities in all of this, in particular thinking about uh, how do we talk with people about this situation, how do we raise issues around use opportunities but also misuse of data with the very diverse populations we're dealing with, how, how are we doing this and what can social science and humanity uh, do for that. I mean, certainly, I mean, it goes without saying that there is a very big project here of literacy, which of course is part of a much broader project of literacy, <laughs> which goes well beyond for the world of data, but it's, I think it's becoming part and parcel with the project of what we think about education right now. So that's, that's a very, very big topic. I mean, one of the reasons that I have, I have a book now that I, 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 I wrote in Italian and now translated in French, specifically to, it's, it's a trade book, specifically to try and think with people who are not academics about these issues in, in situations like in Italy where there's basically almost no discussion there also, like all these kinds of topics. So I think there is a role for people who are dealing with data management in reaching out 
in intersecting with education programs at the national, the regional, the city, and even the school level, like in thinking about how do we enrich literacy ourselves and everybody else is on, on, on these issues. This said, I mean, as I said before, these are incredibly complicated issues that even people who spent 30 years thinking about cannot resolve. Even for experts now, sitting in your corner on your own is not going to work. You have to have a big team of people who help you to think through this stuff. So I think it's also completely pointless to pretend, that would be my opinion, controversial, that any one citizen who's got lots of other things to think about and lots of other worries in their life has to become an expert in data to make decisions about what people will do in a situation where you're in an emergency room or you have a very sick relative and all of a sudden now you have to think cogently about what are the potential implications we share in family genetic data, for instance. It's completely ridiculous, right? So I think we really are in a situation where you need governance models and institutions that take responsibility. And that is where there's huge political difficulties because you may want to make them independent of government, like in a national sense, right? I mean, in very different places, certainly here at this moment. And so the, this raises very big issues around what status will these institutions have, what is the relationship with national funding, with other sources of funding, there's all of that. It also opens up this space to think about, okay, so what kind of experts should be involved in the safeguarding institutions? And I think the importance, I mean, but of course that's very biased completely because that's where I'm coming from, right? But for me it's shocking, like it's repeatedly, and I'm sure you have a similar experience, constantly shocking to go into many of these discussions, not just about data, but about pretty much anything to do with social implication of science and technology, and see that nobody experts in those areas has any clue that there are people doing science and technology studies, there are people doing qualitative and quantitative research on these issues. Right? And that's a huge pity. <laughs> because, you know, sure, it's very important to consult with as many stakeholders as you want and, and to, you know, but at the same time, there are fields in academia that have really you know, constructed a very important body of knowledge looking exactly at that, with all the expertise that goes, as you know, into fabricating and kind of developing this kind of knowledge. So, yeah, so that's why it's very important. Right? And, and I think some institutions recognize, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a Turing fellow now, the Alan Turing Institute, it's been very difficult to get that message even to a place like Alan Turing. I mean, in the end, they keep conceptualizing data science as basically computer engineering plus maths. That is a huge mistake. Of, of, of immeasurable proportions because um, understanding governance, understanding ethical issues, I mean, that's at the core of what data science really should do. So I think that's the place, and you know, it's not a satisfactory answer, but at least it goes some way, or hopefully, towards uh, replying to you. Uh, global competition about which platform will work with most? Health data? Oh God, yeah, that's, um, that's a very interesting one. Uh, particularly because, of course, I mean, decolonizing this. Is, is the problem of our century. I think it's, it's I, I don't think there's even, there's a bigger problem than this. Given the huge potential for increasing inequality in the situation, rather than decreasing it, for making people who have technological resources more and more powerful versus people that just become sort of data, you know, they're called data providers, but really they're just, you know, being exploited for whatever information they can provide. I mean, that's a huge issue all over the place. So, I mean, an example that for me is very clear in my mind is we, we have now this big project at the Chile Institute, which I'm, I'm leading sort of the successor to the ERC, uh, where we're looking at what's going on in the agricultural realm about basically what I would call bioperspective, but other people call working with local communities to uh, make sure that their knowledge of local plants gets inserted into global databases. Right? I mean, there's very different ways of thinking about that process. And for me, it's one of the interesting, particularly because actually, um, if you think that biomedicine is marketized, wait until you go into agricultural research. I mean, they're not only is marketized, but you only have four corporations that control pretty much all of the seed market in the world. So that's, <laughs> in a sense, a more extreme situation. There's, you know, you just don't know what's going on in there. So, yeah, I mean, that's a huge fight, and there's absolutely no obvious and simple answers to this. I think there's interesting projects that are trying to bridge this. So I'm working, for instance, a lot now with the crop ontology, where you have a situation where, I mean, really, actually, probably the only answer is consultation, consultation, consultation. So it's, it's a spectrum of thought around 
how does one involve say local communities of farmers uh, in decisions about how their knowledge is being represented and, and then you know, used abroad and of course there's both an element of also the project in Israel that started actually in, in April doing something very similar with the Bedouin communities there like how do you use something as an instrument of political representation often for communities that actually don't have that don't have much of a voice while at the same time not using in a sense to some extent your you know relation to those materials and, and I mean there are organizations that are trying to do this but it's a very complex process because there's consultations at every single level from the level of the global database to the level of back and forth and they have to be again effective so they have to go and, and they can never stop because all of this knowledge keeps moving both at the bottom level and at the level of the big uh, global structures I mean in some words this is actually at least accepted to be the gold standard and in many others it's not so, you know, and I think there's a big discussion to be had, which can be having also with the welcome, about what is the role of big private foundations and trusts in some of these dynamics. I mean, I think, for instance, when it comes to the Bill and Melinda Foundation, the Gates Foundation, that is sometimes a big issue in terms of how are they thinking about the implications of pushing open data policy so strongly in communities which are actually very vulnerable. You know, they're starting to think about this too, but let's just say that they, that wasn't really the impetus at the beginning when they started to push that project. So, you know, so I think that's the kind of what we're trying to do. Um, now, that brings straight to the data value question um, that Marcos um, raised. Very difficult one. I think one potential response, which is not just more philosophical, but I think not just me, other people like the Channel Florida have been trying to push, is this idea that maybe thinking about ownership as a way to understand data value is completely misguided. Right? And I'll give you an example. So um, I was in a panel a few years back uh, talking about um, the marketization of personal data in biomedicine. And as part of the panel, there was an IBM representative. And there was somebody that was working for the Ministry of Defense in the UK that was basically a consultant for one of the big uh, pharmaceutical corporations. And the argument that this person made before I started speaking, which was really fabulous because I just thought, thanks for giving me the exact way in which this actually is working now, is, you know, data is all about consent because people own their data, they have that right, they have the right to own their personal data. That means they can sell them whenever they want. And once they've sold them, says the military person, it's as if somebody signs up for military service. You cannot take a step back right before you're going to die under a bomb. You signed up. That's it. You know, all the rest, your life is now, you know, in a sense, deriving from that choice. Now, I look at him and I'm thinking, we're thinking about 12-year-olds playing video games. We're thinking about neonatal care. Like, how, I, I, how is any of this fitting into this model of, I own my data and therefore I'm responsible when I give it away? It's madness. I think it's madness. So I think, you know, much better to just move away from this idea that people are own their data. Which of course is difficult, because there's also implication on the negative side, but it means that you're thinking about use, not about ownership, not about consent. I mean, I think that could be an interesting starting point to think about data value in a way which is more socially progressive, but you know, it's, it's still something that a lot of people are working on, and how does it translate in a biomedical system, which, as you were saying, you know, is a system where it's actually the whole idea that we're even acknowledging the right of consent is recent. So how do you implement that idea in that world is, is, is a huge issue. You know, but I think at least that would be the right starting point conceptually to, to approach this question. Um, I think I've sort of declined already to the question about um, fairness in AI. Um, because I think you're completely right that you know when we think about things like the contextualization, contextualization, recontextualization, there are different types of bias. You know, the idea that you need to make AI fair also introduces bias. But I think there's actually a big problem with how we think about bias in the first place. First of all, because there's lots of different types of bias which are involved in these discussions, but they never get clarified. But that's a philosophical like, problem I have, which yeah. is just my frustration with definitions, which is fine. Like, uh, nobody else has that kind of actually Well, two of us at the panel, but for the rest, you're all safe in that respect. But, um, but more, more importantly, is this idea that, again, you know, if you think that data is a sort of given, you know, a lot of these ideas around bias actually come from that. So the idea that 
you have a data source, which is your given, and it's raw data, so you can't touch it. It's like it's, it's the closest you have to you know, what, whatever you know about nature. So anything you do after that is biased, but that data source is like, you know, is a perfect starting point. That's a giant problem. Like, and, and my whole philosophical framework is right to say that. Like, no, I mean, this is not so so to sacred raw data ground. This is a particular type of artifact which has a particular provenance. When we are assess, assessing what that means, we take account of the provenance, and anybody who's in any way good scientist knows that very well. But so if we know that, why thinking that modifying an AI system so that the data is more comprehensive, the data is actually more representative, is more inclusive, is a type of bias. I think that's, I mean, you're completely right, I hear this objection many times, but for me, that's really an unfounded objection, and it's based on a really wrong way to think about what are the data sources, what a data source even is, right? And so that goes also to these questions around bias in the system. I mean, you're completely right. You decontextualize, recontextualize, standardize in lots of different ways. That introduces all sorts of, I mean, rather than bias, I would call them decision making moments yeah. mm -hmm. when you're discriminating in, in a data system, which is why it's such a conceptually charged system, because people have been making decisions, whether they're automated or not, all through the whole set of, um, set of issues. So, I mean, for me, one of the ways in which I'm trying to work on this practically also with um, many different data platforms. I mean, you can, you can summarize it as saying, you know, data linkage and data aggregation is to have an historical conscience, which for some people is very clear, and for others is much less clear. So it needs to have a accountability for the history of data processing, as you're conceptualizing, for people being able to track it back once you've aggregated the data, and for them to be, you know, in a sense, a user-friendly way to think about that history. All of which is a very big set of demands and very, very well organized, very difficult to, to actually get it done. But again, it's, I think it's the next step, you know, from when we're thinking about all these big data conglomerates. I mean, people have started to realize how important data provenance is now. I don't think that's really an issue anymore. It can be an issue to implement that, but everybody recognizes it's important to make progress of the data. But the processing and the, the, the manner of linkage and the extent to which you can be linked and be aggregated now that I think is the next frontier, because many platforms haven't really done that systematically, partly because it's so difficult to do, there's little concerted efforts around it, but I think that's the next frontier because that's where you're starting to not so much combat the bias, but make it possible for people to kind of um, think critically Maybe about... Exactly, so think critically about data provenance and processing, and just not take it as a sort of um, given work. And I think that goes, I mean, you know, my answers to the questions around semantics and capabilities would be exactly the same thing. We did a whole series of um, papers in a project with um, some colleagues in Exeter, but now some of which are in Oxford with some other collaborators of yours, um, on what does it mean to think about the capacity in a much sense economic technology of people around the world to pick up and reuse open data. And we did especially research in um, Central and Southern Africa. And it was very clear, lots of labs of people that are doing amazing scientific work, but literally didn't have the capability to pick up some of these things. I mean, from simple technical issues like there's no global for half of the day, to questions around how do I resource my probes when working in the lab, to questions around what kind of training to have to access to. We did a big report on the problems of many people who, in theory, should be using, because they're working in very low resource um, research environments, in theory, they should be using this wonderful um, <coughs> free and open uh, source software to do the data analysis, because it's there and it's possible to use it. But in fact, felt that they couldn't, because a lot of interviews with people, like Kashmir, Tanzania, and Ghana, etc., because the journals they were targeting for publication would really prefer people to use proprietary software. And so again, you know, if you didn't access the proprietary software, there's all sorts of barriers around how you're going to then implement an analysis and then like, bring it to a certain kind of publication culture, kind of um, globalized, but very much lower control. Mm -hmm. right? So I think, yeah, you see these issues all the time, and that's something that we need to absolutely focus on. I'll leave things because uh, there were too many, <laughs> <laughs> too many issues, but thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
the afternoon we have a meeting and small questions in the afternoon. Yes. Abriremos agora, né, para quem quiser fazer perguntas por gentileza, pedimos que levante a mão. Está todo mundo satisfeito com as perguntas feitas pela mesa? Isso é presente, né? Good morning, everyone. I'm Rodrigo from University of Fifth Santana. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the docs for the celebration and Professor Leonelli for the talk. It was uh, quite informative and, and, and enlightening. Um, and as a computer scientist, I uh, something in your presentation caught my attention. That was the talk on data quality. And I was wondering about missing data. And considering now we are getting better and better, in generating big data, we still have to face the problem of generating big missing data. And I would just like to, to hear something about your experience and maybe some of your learned lessons on the problems on, on missing data. And of course, we know that the impact on linkage, on artificial intelligence, inferences, and, and, and so that's, that's I'd like to, to know if you have any, any thoughts or, or learned lessons on missing data that Unfortunately, is a, a set proof in Brazil and especially in our public data sets. I would also love to hear what the other panelists have to say about this actually, yeah. because I'm sure you've encountered this like um, very often. I mean, for me, just to give you maybe a more philosophical answer, I mean, one of the things that's frustrating sometimes is the fact that there's missing data absolutely everywhere because there's no such thing as a complete data set anyhow. Like, that's a, that's a very problematic <coughs> Right. But of course, there's particular situations where you usually don't have any data about a particular religion or a particular time frame, or the data that you have are, are, are problematic and you know, temporally, like for instance, misery or things like that. And I think one of the problems that comes with this expectation that working with big data means working with lots of givens, lots of facts that are sort of already there, is the fact that people tend to be not very creative, actually, especially some people that are working with on the AI side, on thinking about what does it even mean to have missing data. Because I, mean, I think a lot of researchers on the ground, especially researchers that are working on web medicine, like in, um, you know, like uh, certainly climate science, in pest control and pest pathogen interactions and pest predatory, all of these kinds of things, they're very, very used to the fact that, in fact, sometimes big gaps can themselves be really important sources of knowledge. And, I don't know, I mean, it's a big generalization, but I'm seeing a lot of work in terms of exploiting data that we have, in terms of algorithmic power, much less in thinking about, well, how do we think about the gaps, you know, or what appear to be gaps? I mean, what knowledge are we gaining about the circles of data collection, about the conditions in a particular region, from data that are just not there, and from potential expectations about data that may be there, but are just not, you know, that, that kind of thing. I mean, it would be an interesting question to think about if one takes this much more constructive approach and relational approach to data, I mean, what kind of algorithm could you design to think about those absences? For instance, we, I mean, some colleagues of mine in accident doing a lot of work on the temporality of um, the spread of plant pathogens around the world. And there's wonderful organization that produce these really interesting world maps for every year, of, you know, or every month, even every year, about where particular uh, plant pests will be an other spread, which of course right now is a huge question because given you know, what's going on with coffee, banana and all the big staples in the world, there's a big question around monitoring this. They're very aware, that like increasingly more aware, of the fact that the temporality of this data is really problematic. I mean, they're really unreliable maps, basically, because you know, in some parts of the world, it may take two years from data being collected on a particular field and then actually be reported to a field station, and then maybe another two years before they're in fact uh, sent to you know the more mm -hmm. typically global north centralized uh, mapping uh, service that then puts that information on a map. But it's interesting because now there starts to be a lot of discussion around what does one do with that issue. You know, how can we absorb that into the map? Particularly now that we are very often looking at maps and algorithms which are not static. I mean, we can work with dynamically changing knowledge. We can allow people to, especially on a screen, click and try to get some information about different parts of a map, right? So I think it's that kind of mentality that could help.
because there's never going to be a situation where we're just going to have just better data. You know, it's just not happening, I don't think. And we shouldn't even expect that to happen in some ways. But the question is how do we learn to do AI in a you know, pathologically incomplete <laughs> kind of data set? I mean, that would be a more interesting question for me. It's a very nice question. I think from the, the computer science, I think uh, the, the missing, missing as mechanism is very uh, close to the context. So I think for me, missing data is not actually a, a problem, but it's a fact and we need to deal with. And I think one of the potential use of, of uh, AI or machine learning models is, is uh, to try to, uh, to infer the correct values from missing data. I think we are doing this in the wrong way. If, if, you, have data, if, if you have a data set with a, a missing value on a gender or, or age attribute, usually we try to, uh, to infer the, the missing value from looking at the other genders or, 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 or age attributes. And I think for me it's, it makes more sense if you can, I can look on similar records of, of the same entities and, and try to infer the values from those similar records. So I think we can use data linkage of some kind of stratification with the same data set and try to look for similar records and then uh, the, so I think this is one of, one of the main points inside the most of the imputation methods we use today because I think we try to create or infer values looking at to the wrong place or in some sense. Uh, thank you for your very illustrative and very interesting uh, talk. Uh, thank you for the remarks also for the friends here and colleagues. Uh, I would like to ask you what a foreign question, which, is, which has some philosophical grounds. Uh, data about climate yeah, uh, has been stored for the past uh, 100 years or 200 years, but uh, uh, data on climate exists uh, since the Earth began being formed. The issue that I think is that now people with the technology have the condition of storing and managing more and more and more. In your thoughts, in your problems that you think, uh, uh, for storing, we have taken advantage of miniaturization. It's possible to store huge amount of data on ships, very small ships, okay? But, uh, and now, because, because of this, uh, the amount of information that is stored worldwide is increasing in a pace that people have never been before, seen before. Is there a limit to that? Is there a limit? Another question. It's not only uh, the issue of uh, storing information, it's processing information. Processing information is, has a much more intensive cost than story. And uh, how can we, uh, our limited uh, brain size, uh, capture uh, all kinds of information that would be possible to analyze if you could uh, uh, process all these data? Yeah? Uh, things, uh, although I'm a physicist, uh, this comes for me from uh, other from philosophical questions. I don't think whether the humanity is thinking about this, I think that uh, it's an interesting and I would like to hear your opinion about it. Thank you, that's an incredibly interesting and really important question, it's a crucial question. I think, you know, there are institutions since centuries whose job has been to think about what does it, what does it mean to have memory and how do we store information with the idea that we don't know what people in 100, 200, 300 years from now will do with that information. This is not a new thing. Archives, banks of different types, uh, seed banks, for instance, stock centers, I mean, this type of places has, has, has that thinking. Right? I mean, what worries me very often around both the question of storage and the question of processing is the fact that what I often see is people who become paralyzed by 
thinking that, well, in fact, the opportunities of big data are so huge that we just cannot settle on a particular vision for reuse. We shouldn't, because any kind of reuse is possible. Therefore, we're not going to discriminate at all. We're just going to try and capture any information we can without discrimination. That worries me deeply because that's, I mean, you're not at that point capturing any information you can. Well, actually, you are capturing information you can, but there's a very selective data set already, right? And, and there is, when you see that kind of paralysis, there actually is less reflection on why we're capturing certain data and what could be the potential use, partly because there's this pretense so people will say, well, we're just capturing what we can and we'll think about this data. I think that's very problematic. I mean, certainly in biology, for instance, there's been this huge tendency in the last 20 years of capturing genomic data, genetic data. Why? Because we invested billions of dollars, euros, yen, etc., etc., in creating the facilities to sequence, and that investment had to be immediately kind of uh, operationalized by creating data banks, by creating I mean, a lot of the history of data banks in biology, really counts for genetic health. And so, these data were created as data entities that were storable digitally and reusable digitally. But this has come to the expense of a lot of potential work that could have on data which arguably are much more rare, much more precious, and potentially more reusable than genetic data, imaging data, storage of material, germplasm, you know, all of these kinds of things. I mean, I think that's a big problem, because now we're starting to see, now it's actually more common in biology to have discussions where people say, well, actually, yes, still know the sequencing data, I mean, in some cases it's very important, in other cases it's completely nonsense because we can recreate them very quickly. What we really need to store for is the samples, because these are the things that we can't recreate, right? These are the things that really become important historically. Now. I mean, I don't mean to say that there's an easy solution in any way, I mean, this is a, a giant problem, but at least to have constant and constructive discussion about which choices are we making implicitly or explicitly when we're thinking about memory, you know, what the department calls memory practices. I mean, that's really important. And I think one of the tendencies that I don't like in this kind of big data world is we're losing this. Because there is this, you know, the hype still is, we just store whatever we can. And that is just not good enough. Because that means we end up storing only the things that in that particular technological moment it makes sense to store and we are, we are able to store. It doesn't mean that we're storing the most important source of information. It doesn't mean that we are, you know, and that's problematic. I mean, you know, if you think, if you think about what's going on at the CERN, where, you know, we have now 60 years worth of really important experiments there, and anything older than 20 years we don't have any access to because of only floppy disks. And there's only a couple of people in the 3,000 people that the CERN employs that are basically downloading the floppies into a digital data format day after day, and that's their job, but that's obviously not enough, so they're never going to get, you know, what's the, <laughs> you know, that clearly is a situation where there hasn't been thinking, you know, about what happens in 100, 200, 300 years from now. And when I talk to people who are, for instance, dealing with germplasm banks or, or biobanks, I mean, it's important for them, they're thinking in terms of hundreds of years. They have to, and there's a long tradition to do that. When I talk to people very often who are dealing with this data, they're thinking, we're not sure whether we're surviving five years from now. So thinking about 100 years is completely out of the question. I think that's a problem. Um, very, very quickly. So uh, I think that there are two things very interesting. Uh, one of the things I suggest, I don't know if you have an opportunity to read her book. <laughs> Well, the, the question of the data and the biological data. So I think that is very interesting how uh, she, she took it historically. So since the 18th century, I think so. Yeah. And uh, for me, this is a question of the biography of the data. How to follow the data historically, how we can follow the data politically as well. So we can store incredible amounts of the data, the data now, but uh, are we using this technology to have a better world, to yeah. knowledge to improve uh, medicine for, for all? Uh, my question is so simple because I am in a European consortium about Zika 
and uh, in that consortium we have more than 54 uh, uh, international partners. Few Cruz is the third one of this this group. So, and uh, we also have Sanofi there, and all the data are stored there, and how to compete with Sanofi and Few Cruz. So we produce testing, we produce diagnosis tests. How to deal with this? So I think that is not necessarily the question how we can store, but how we can use this for improve equity. And I am especially concerned about how to process data uh, uh, in the, the, the competition between uh, countries from the global north and low and middle income countries. So how to, to get sustainability to answer to our questions. So, usually I am in international groups uh, that they are countries, when you talk about global health, for instance, global health is not global. They are interested in um, a tropical disease, and disease from the low and middle income countries. It's not for the UK and the US, they are not adopting anything about the global health. So, yeah, this is something. Just to, to discuss. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, first, you thank you, Sabine, for your enlightening talk and the commentators. I, I'd like to put you a, a question that uh, in the, in the, with the increase of data, the intensive increase of data, can appear one thing that uh, I don't know well what it is that people call data science. Nah? Data science is uh, as well as one science of data, nah? because it's in singular, nah? not plural. But uh, by the other side, can the data it change the way to do the normal science. Nah? Genetics become genomics. Nah? Uh, the astronomer nowadays, they have a huge challenge to use the, the huge amount of data. Physicists nah? used to be a small set of data now have a collider and the, uh, and the big experiment that they generate. Uh, in epidemiology, in health, they start to use a great amount of data. Then you use, in some of you write uh, papers, you use the term uh, data-centric science. Huh? Then I'd like you to, to expand more this idea, okay, what your view exists in data science, or this uh, data flow and the new things will change the way that people do science, yeah? Because it, for them, in the past, existed some language that were used in science, for example, statistics. Statistics is a science, but become a language now that I use statistics uh, to interpret quantitative results né, as, a, as a language in my, in my domain. I mean, not a decision, but I use statistics. Né? Mathematics, I can use a mathematical model without to be a mathematician, né? but it's a, it's a language. Né? Then, what you see the feature né, of science, because it is, in my view, creates some confusion yeah, in, the, in, the, uh, in the academic area. Né? The, you, you, data science will occupy a new space, uh, or the, the science needed to develop their own methods, their own capacity to be uh, capable to answer questions that the traditional health have as in science, use now not more only few, a few set of data, but a large set of data, uh, which are the quality or the characteristics or the model of inference and the other things. Then I'd like to see your independent comments. Thank you, that's a fascinating question. Um, I think the example of statistics is a very, very good one when it comes to this, because statistics also, as a, you know, a relatively recent history after all, I mean it's a science that we only really have been developing in the last hundred years or less, and that also has been a science that has come a field that has come from particular applications in very particular fields. 
has come to be recognized as something that actually could also have an independent life because there was a need for people doing that kind of numerical work on data models to compare the work with each other and think about tools and methodologies with a specific data. But also has continued to have a life within each domain of application, which is also very specific. I mean, you know, somebody who knows very well about statistics and biomedicine and biomedical application is not necessarily a statistician that works with a climate science or with astronomers, say. So I think data science probably doesn't have such a dissimilar trajectory in that sense. I mean, it's got to be, I, I'm, I'm positive about recognizing this as a field, even if it's a very complex, multidisciplinary type of ecosystem field, because I see the fact that people who are experts in data management, processing, algorithms, etc., need to actually talk to each other. And, and, and because there are problems in common, there are issues that go beyond domain application, and that is a very important thing to do. At the same time, the applicability for data science is defined. I mean, in the end, yes, you can have a few groups of data scientists that work on refining methods, but really the most interesting work typically comes from data scientists which are embedded in particular domains of application. So the reason why I like to think about data-centric science is because we are seeing a situation where many different fields are, as you are saying, needing to really rethink some of their methods in light of the opportunities of big data and associated methods. This needs to happen with assistance and you know, very much an integrated approach with data scientists who also spend some of their time talking to other data scientists and other domains about what is going on. But at the same time, um, one of the things that for me is always striking is that many of the longer term methods that have been elaborated in different fields to think about how do you choose your target of investigation, how do you sample, how do you think of different types of bias. I mean, all of these things not only are still important, but they become even more important. Because now the, the potential instantiation in data intensive systems has, has bigger implications, because I mean, a lot of issues with bias get amplified. So it, 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 it's dual move. On one hand, yes, there's got to be more awareness within distinct domains about the innovation data science. I mean, I think many people probably in this room, I certainly am involved in many training programs. We have one also in Exeter where I'm teaching a domain specific scientists like biologists how to think about data governance issues specifically for their subject. And there's lots of that going on. So I think the generational issue, the next generation of scientists in every field, I'm sure will have much more of that apparatus. But as I said, the amount of competencies that come with really being able to process data properly, I mean, it's not something that anybody within one domain can absorb. So there's going to be, you know, biology again is a good example because we've seen that already in the history of the field. I mean, there is biology and there is the fact that training programs in biology have to include bioinformatics, have to include more statistics now. I mean, there is that kind of wisdom we develop in the field. But there is bioinformatics as a distinctive subfield where there are people who actually do data science specifically for biology. And this relates to data science as a whole. Because these people, again, intersect back with the community of people who are doing general methods. I think, I mean, to me, that's going to have to be the way in which this gets framed. Which in practical terms means, you know, for any group of people in any one university doing research in a field, you probably would want there to be a specialized data scientist who has at least the competence to bring the broader data science discussion back into the field and to go back to the broader discussion of the science when there's a new problem arising in the application. I mean, there needs to be that kind of mediation, just, otherwise the work is just too much. But I mean, that's, that's sort of how I see it. So I see why you would want to think about data science as a separate domain, but also I think the fact that all of the fields are becoming more data attentive, if you want, is also very important and it kind of goes together. Uh, maybe just, just to compliment, I think Maurice has pointed out a very uh, Interesting question. For me, science was always about data. I think we just moved from a small pieces of data to a large amounts of data. But I think the, the maybe the uh, at the beginning I, I saw data science as another buzzword. Okay, people are talking. I, I do cloud computing, big data, machine learning, but I am how to do data science. <laughs> but um, but now I think data science is more about um, moving from an individual. Um, research to a collective research. So I, I agree with you. I think now we have to... Uh, 
the idea of a data science uh, as the, the, the person who must know uh, statistics and mathematics and comput computational methods and visualization, play tennis and do yoga, etc. I think it's completely wrong. I think it's a, it's a, it's a team work. And uh, I, I, for me, I think the major movement was to, to put attention, okay, we, we need a team discussing several aspects of data science to provide some useful. So I think this is the, the major uh, movement or shift we, we can uh, uh, relate to data science. Agradecemos imensamente pela contribuição da área dos debatedores e pela palestra excelente de Sabina para enriquecer essa manhã. Encerramos este momento de seminário Cidades, uma nova cultura de pesquisa e saúde. Agradecemos a presença de cada um em nome de toda a equipe de Cidades. Agradeço especialmente aos convidados, né, que deram a honra de suas apresentações hoje. Proveitoso para todos. Aproveitamos agora o momento para anunciar é, que o debate continua à tarde, né, com diálogos com Sabine, teremos uma conversa lá no primeiro andar no, na sala que a gente usa e convidamos a todos para a próxima terça-feira dia 10, a partir das 9 horas comparecerem ao Science Slam, o festival de divulgação científica dos Cidades nesse evento, os pós-doutorandos dos Cidades terão 5 minutos para apresentar de forma clara e criativa os seus estudos. Esperamos ver você lá. É, neste momento, convidamos os participantes que ficarão à tarde a, até a área de convivência do Tecnocentro, onde será servido um brunch. Tenha a todos um ótimo dia. É, só um momento, mais um recado aqui. Vamos todos tirar uma foto coletiva desse momento. Né? Com Sabina, lá fora. Aqui na frente não vou embora não. Vamos lá tirar a foto e depois a gente.